Reap. Can you hear it? Welcome to Relay. Ooh, hello everyone. Hi. Hey, the, the clip, it's, uh, it's time to start right now. Uh, so welcome everyone to uh, episode three? Three of Relay Space. Uh, this week's podcast is going to be s- focused on life in orbit. But before we get to that, I'm David. That is Nakara. Uh, and we're going to start with a quote from a person much more intelligent and, and you know, better at spacey stuff than we are, which you can clearly tell by my uh, good words. From Chris Hadfield, uh, if you don't like airline food, you'll probably have the same impression of space station food. I would not fly to space for the food. Good quote. I think he's probably correct about that. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna hop in shortly into um, into space stations and life in orbit. Um, <laughs> there's no cake. I have no cake. Actually, just hold on a moment. Oh, do you have some cake? Yes. Oh, sweet. Um, anyway, before we we begin, I just wanted to sum up sort of what we've done in previous episodes. So the the first episode we sort of uh, summarized almost a, a history of of SpaceX and and where SpaceX uh, ha, you know came from and and where they are now. And then the second episode we kind of continued with SpaceX and and where they are now and going into the future. Um, but of course, oh look, cake. <laughs> uh, but of course, because we're talking about about space and SpaceX and you know all sorts of things that have to do with space, we are going to start this week, and we'll probably be starting most weeks with a roundup of the space news for the week. So, space news of the week. Uh, <laughs> while I try yes. and fix, while I try and fix the the green, slightly green filter on your face. No, nope, yeah, I was wondering screen. about. <laughs> that's a face. Hey, that's a green screen. Uh, There's a face. That'll do. Um, <laughs> it's let's. Totally still- <laughs> uh, whatever. Let's. Uh, oh, that's great. Okay. It's, it's throw, us up, throw us up an image. Yeah. Let's start with um, this All week right. in space. So, the title of this week in space this week is Dear Moon. Um. So we had an update on uh, BFR and BFS uh, yesterday from the illustrious Elon Musk. Um. Right away, it looks different. Um, it's also something not everybody got right away. It's also 12 meters taller, um, which will make it the tallest rocket ever built by about 20 feet or 7 or 8 meters. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but those fins are new. Yes, they are. And you know what, David? They're actually legs. <gasps> they're legs. They look like fins. And they're fins and legs. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the bottom two. Um, actually, you can't see one of them there. We'll have to go to another image. David, can you give me another image? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, BFS? Uh, uh, we'll, BFR. we'll move along. Okay, we'll, we'll just, move along. Just, just in order. Just in order. Yeah. Just in order. Of course. Uh, yeah, so the other <laughs> thing that's to, to note is that um, so it not only gained fins at the back, it gained a fin at the front. 
um, on each side, obviously. Two fins at the front. Um, but the other thing, again, that not everybody noticed was the BFS itself got quite a little bit larger. Um, it now has over a thousand cubic meters of pressurized volume inside of the payload section. And it's also um, much straighter for much longer. Um, it doesn't have as much of a cone shape on the front of it as the previous one did. Um, I really think this was to be able to fit more payloads into its payload bay when it's flying as a cargo craft. Because um, before it was, it really quickly tapered into a cone. So it makes it really awkward to put things into the uh, payload bay. Um, so, uh, feel free to move along to the next picture. I'm also trying to tweet because I forgot to do that. Yeah, tweet. I'm Jeez. working on it. Next picture. This is from the back. So this uh, this one, you can tweet more now. I, I got lots of stuff to talk about here. <laughs> Go. Um, so, as you can see, they actually point out that there's landing pads on the end of each of the uh, fins. And so the bottom two fins are actuated. They actually uh, move, and they will ch basically move um, and change the... Uh, profile of the bfs to the atmosphere as it's entering so that it can control how uh how um how much lift it has when it's entering the atmosphere and uh and so that third fin actually um has, actually doesn't serve any aerodynamic purpose it is just as elon said a leg it's just a leg so is there a reason they went with like fin legs rather than full the outie legs two reasons that we sort of one that he said uh, said right away and one that we've sort of surmised um one that he said is it looks better um they like how it looks better quite a bit um the other the other aspect though is it does give the uh it does give bfs um a much wider stance when it so it's got a way broader base when it's landed um so it should be less susceptible to tipping over um in you know nasty situations um wow there's some uh, serious fighting going on there in the chat between uh, two rascals there's a couple rascals in chat yeah. Um, so you'll also <laughs> notice they they added some extra cargo space around the engines. So this would be cargo that would travel in uh, in vacuum, of course. Um, and uh, interestingly, that that room is made there because they opted to not use vacuum engines on the on BFS. This is a big departure for most like basically all spacecraft, all. Um, upper stages of spacecraft use vacuum rated engines um but to try and limit the amount of risk they have on this gigantic ridiculously huge and extremely complex vehicle they decided to only build one engine for um bfr and use it everywhere so it has for the first version it will only have one type of engine which is a sea level engine and it will be used on the ship and the booster now, this does decrease its payload capability to 100 tons, a little over 100 tons to orbit and 100 tons to Mars, um, as opposed to the 150 tons from before. But one of the reasons why they put all that cargo there is they're actually reserving room. So in the future, they can upgrade BFS with the vacuum nozzles and the vacuum engines, and they'll be able to, it'll be able to give it even more power. Um, nice. that it currently has. Anyway, we can move along. We shall. <clears throat> that's a pretty. That is a pretty. Yep, that's what that picture is. Um, and I like it a lot. You can keep going. Yeah, <laughs> I don't it's have just... anything particular to say about that. It's just pretty. Yep. So is this one. Yep, I do love that picture, though, because... Uh, uh, this seriously it makes it look like a spear, like going into the sky. Uh, I keep so thinking cool. it's like a uh, a broadhead, or not a broadhead, but yeah, like a, totally. an arrow. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, I know that the 
it doesn't need to look cool, but it really does. And SpaceX with... has always SpaceX has always tried to do the whole rule of cool thing. Well, one of the things that that's always disappointed a lot of people, not just me, is that rockets just don't look as cool as the space shuttle did. Mm-hmm. The space exactly. shuttle. This one does. Looked <laughs> well. This one does, but yeah. they've taken a rocket the space shuttle, and made yeah, it shuttle It's amazing. I love it. Yep. Yep. Look at that. Look at that thing. Exactly. So this is a shot of stage separation. So um, you can't really see it here, but there are grid fins on the uh, on the booster stage. So basically, here the BFS is continuing on to orbit. The booster is going to go back down to ground. Um, and uh, yeah, now uh, even this even with these look... styling changes, the the whole plan is still functionally the same as they had in that that SpaceX like the the big video of show like the the whole earth to earth and earth to mars video functionally yes. it's all the same right yeah yes all every they didn't really touch a lot on those because this was very focused on this on the updates to the vehicle and on specifically the moon mission um but yes, nothing has really changed. Uh, Gwyn Shotwell touched on the on the Earth to Earth stuff recently. She mentioned that they're going to put the landing pads in international waters so that they don't have to deal with all of the local laws everywhere. Um, <laughs> so they're just going to put all of their landing uh, landing platforms in international waters, and, and then, then just like transport people, people from them. Yeah, yeah. Probably in high speed boats, or eventually they. I think they hope to do it in like hyperloops. I think eventually they're just going to have mini rockets that attach to people's <laughs> backs. So you get off the BFR, strap on a mini <laughs> rocket, and it just rockets you into land and lands. Mm-hmm. At Musk, everything is done with rockets. They're going to feed you on the rocket with miniature rockets. Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, according, Science. According, life according to David. <laughs> All right, let's continue on. Uh, more pretties coming up, I think. Rocket powered cafeteria tray. I like that. So this is the uh, this is the trajectory roughly that they're going to take. Um, uh, basically, it's a simple uh, simple return free return swing around the moon. They're going to use the moon's gravity to swing them back towards Earth. Um, and uh, Elon did talk about a couple different options here. They could do a really close swing by the or by the moon's surface, and then swing really wide um, and get a good, actually quite distant view of the moon and and Earth. Or they could take a more traditional approach like this. Also, he mentioned on the way back that um, they could either go for a straight entry, which would give about six Gs um, during entry. Or they could skim off the atmosphere and go into a low Earth orbit and then land, which would be only about 3 Gs. But it would take longer. Also, this whole trip, this whole trajectory is about 5 to 6 days. That's insane. It's, it's kind of funny being reminded of how far the moon actually is away from Earth. It takes, yeah, it ain't really close. It takes time to get there. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I love this picture. Um, these, this actually shows the solar panels out. So it has these fin-shaped solar panels that uh, come out from uh, back near the fins. Um, oh, it's back near the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it has fins on its fins. No, um, it has these, uh, yeah, fan-shaped solar panels is what I meant. Um, back by the fins. Um, and, uh, this is just a great shot of the, of them heading towards, uh, the moon. All right, let's continue on. This, this picture really bugs me. I feel like the perspective is off. Yeah, it probably is, but it just bothers this me. On, the engine I also, looks like it's on an angle, but the rocket looks like it's straight. <laughs> Sorry. Fair enough. Um, but uh, this is the first picture we got, and uh, so it, it definitely generated a lot of buzz. And uh, it is still a pretty cool picture, even if the perspective's a little off. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
Don't mind me. I'm picky. God. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, yeah. This is one of a couple images that really make me think that this that this ship looks really cool. Uh, I just love that top-down view of it with the front fins. And yeah, it's really neat. I, uh, I'm definitely buying a VR headset for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's actually something I should mention. Yes. Um, Elon Musk, Elon Musk today. So, um, well after the event confirmed that SpaceX will be streaming the whole mission live in uh, high definition and VR. Um, my Vive so, yeah. headset is now worth every single penny just to be able to put it on when this launches and crap yeah. my pants at home instead of on a spaceship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we don't know the the uh, resolution or anything. He just said high definition VR. Um, High definition, high definition and VR. The, the more interesting thing is, didn't they say that um, they'll be able to do it due to Starlink? Yeah. Which, for those of you that don't remember episode two, last episode, actually, uh, Starlink is the ridiculously ambitious and insane uh, constellation of satellites that Elon is planning on putting around the entire world to provide everyone next to zero latency, high speed satellite internet. Yeah. And also um, access to VR streams of the BFR. That's right. <laughs> um, the completion, I mean, I, maybe you don't know what VR is. I'm guessing that's the question. Uh, VR is virtual reality. Like the Vive or the Oculus headset. Um, this picture is amazing. So the the guy standing there, his name is... I'm going to try and get this right for the 25th time here. His name is uh, Yusaku Maizawa. And he is the one who bought this flight around the moon. Um... He approached SpaceX, um, sounds like last year, and originally, um, you'll all remember, or maybe you'll remember, that they had announced that uh, they would be sending two private passengers on a flight around the moon on uh, Crew Dragon aboard uh, after being launched by a Falcon Heavy. This is the same guy. Um... They eventually uh, scrapped their plans to do that, and they decided to move the whole thing over to BFR. And he decided to buy BFR, the whole v the whole BFR, instead of um, you know waiting for other paying passengers. He's paying for the whole thing. We don't know how much it cost him, but Elon described it as a non-trivial portion of the development cost. So a lot, I'm guessing. Um, most guesses I've seen are in the 150 to $500 million range, but it's certainly well over a hundred million dollars, like guaranteed. Um, so now what is he standing on? That is actually a hull section, a completed hull section of BFS, the spaceship section. They have hardware. They actually have real hardware. The rocket is being built. Slowly, in a tent, but it's being built. <laughs> um, so, now, to be clear, this rocket they're building in the tent is not the one that's going to fly him to the moon. The one that's being built in the tent is the prototype, which they're hoping to do hop tests with next year in um, Boca Chica in South Texas, where me and Desmarius will visit in like <laughs> three weeks. Damn you. Yeah. <laughs> Just stay the extra time. <laughs> yes, you should have. Oh. <laughs> um, so... Um, yeah, I was super excited to see this. And just the scale of it is ridiculous. I mean, I, I love this picture. 
but let's continue on so I don't just you know ramble <laughs> on and on. Another great picture for showing scale. So this is the inside of the mandrel, and you're immediately going, what the hell is a freaking mandrel? <laughs> well, a mandrel is a giant metal um, spindle, basically, where that you wrap the com- carbon fiber composite around to form the hull. So the whole hull of the spacecraft is, car- is carbon composite. So it has to be wrapped on this metal um, cylinder and cured, and then they remove the cylinder, and there you go. You have a section of hull. Um, but this is the inside of that uh, gigantic mandrel. So, and this is another great view of the actual hull section. This is the the completed section, and uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. I'm I'm excited. The fact that they're actually manufacturing um, uh, hardware for the vehicle means they're actually quite a ways along. Um, and they did kind of surprise us with the dates that they were talking about today or, or yesterday, weren't they? They were talking like mostly. It was a surprise that the dates haven't slipped yet. Um, they're still looking at 2019 for uh, hops, uh, 2020 for high altitude, high speed testing, and possibly if everything goes right, um, they could they could get to orbit in 2020. Um, probably, unless things go significantly wrong, uh, you probably very likely to see it get to orbit by 2021, by the end of 2021. Um, and then they would basically proceed to launch it a whole... Remember, this the system is fully reusable. So they would proceed to launch it a whole bunch of times to test it. Um, and uh, and um, basically make sure that it's safe before they put humans on it. So they're basically so, working on the, the Star Citizen timeline, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. But we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, what, what he always... What, Elon said about timelines is he's like, well, we have to set a date to work towards of some kind. And he basically said, you know, we choose to make that date the everything goes right and we can launch at this time date. Now, nothing ever goes completely right. So they're probably going to slip a bit, but that's what they're trying to pull off. Now, this is my, I think now my favorite engine. (laughs) It is beautiful. Um, this is the Raptor engine firing, and it is so it's the engine that will power uh, BFR. Um, BFR will have 38 engines, 31 on the boost stage, and seven on the ship. 38 engines. <laughs> um, and and actually, this this firing of Raptor went on for quite a while, and Elon kept waiting for it to end, and it just kept going and going and going. Um, it looks like it's doing just fine. Um, the uh, and yeah, this is a great picture of uh, the two of them. I love this picture, and I love the next picture too. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that one's so good. Great. I I love it. I <laughs> love it. Um so now the question is well why are they doing this? Well, the reason why they're doing this and this is what blew a lot of people away last night. Um His name just gets me. I'm I'm not good with Japanese. Okay. Uh, Yusaku Yusaku Mazawa. Yusaku Mazawa. He um he he's a billionaire from Japan. He um Owns a clothing company called Zozo, uh, zozo.com. And, um, but he's also a very prolific art collector. And, um, he, what he wanted to do was to inspire humanity by inspiring artists. So he wants to take six to eight of hand picked artists that he will invite to the moon. On this trip with him, and um, and basically their trip is free 
but all they have to do is agree to create a work of art um, based on their trip. Um, basically, he's hoping to inspire them to create beautiful works of art which will inspire humanity, which I think is just so cool. Um, and from what it sounded like with what Elon was saying, um, so if there are six to eight artists and um, Yusaku Mizawa, that's uh, seven to nine people, and Elon was talking about a dozen, so I think there's probably three to five SpaceX engineers probably that will go with them to try and fix anything that if it breaks. He also mentioned they're going to be taking a lot of spare parts in case something goes wrong. Um, this is not a mission they want to screw up. So <laughs> they're, uh, they're yeah. um, going to be really careful. Um, but uh, it's just such a cool, inspiring, inspiring thing. I, I was really blown away. A lot of people were really blown away. Um, that this is what the announcement was. Um, keep in mind, this is one guy spending hundreds, probably hundreds of millions of dollars of his own money to basically inspire humanity through art. And I think that's just awesome. Um, now, I'm going to link you all to the uh, video, the official video um, for the project. The project is called Dear Moon. And here is the video. Um, the Kaplish, the guy on top, is Yusaku Mozawa. He is the one who bought the trip. So that is uh, sort of <laughs> yesterday. So that's, yesterday's that's space yesterday. news in a half hour. Um, I'm sorry that took so long. Oh my God. I mean, it's not your I fault. Like it, was it was five a, minutes. It was a big... It was a big day in, in space news, quite frankly. It took, I mean, it took Elon almost two hours to do that presentation. Yeah, so we got you covered in half an hour. We're doing okay. But it is now time for us to move on to the actual spacey science whatever section of, of this week's uh, episode. And we're going to mm -hmm. be talking a little bit about life in orbit. Um, now, huma humanity has had for... A long time, actually, more years than you might imagine, have had some form of space station or space stations, uh, plural, uh, orbiting Earth. Um, right now, we all probably know that it's it's the ISS, uh, the International Space Station, which is a it's the big one. Uh, it's sort of a joint endeavor between the United States and Russia and, you know, a bunch of other uh, countries, Canada, UK, Japan. Uh, and then China also has their, um, what's their yeah, There's called? one other space station to, in orbit right now, which is the Tiangong-2. Yes. Um, but. So that's it right now. That's what there is now. We're going to go uh, back in time just a little bit, though. Uh, yeah, to Salute One. Yeah, let's let's get Salute One up here. Sorry, yeah, I was talking. There we so, go. Salute One, um, was launched in April of 1971, and it was the first space station ever. Um, so that was uh, 47 years ago, almost 50 years ago now. Um. Unfortunately, this was the site of one of the first fatalities in space. Um, and that was... Um, so, here's what happened. The, first, the world's first successful manned space station mission was overshadowed when the crew was killed before the re-entry of Soyuz 11 on June 30th of 1971 when a pressure equalization valve in the descent module of the Soyuz opened prematurely um, when the three modules, modules of the spacecraft separated, which suffocated all three. This is um, the Soyuz space capsule. 
amazingly, Soyuz is still made the same way, essentially, now. Um, it has three different modules to it. Basically, the modules separated prematurely, um, and the all of the air escaped because the, the valves weren't closed, and they suffocated. It was one of the only actual... Um, uh, fatalities like event uh, fatal events in space because for example most of um, NASA's uh, deaths have been um, in atmosphere before they get to space um, or after they're re-enter, re-entering the atmosphere from coming, coming back from space um, and yeah uh, it was a very basic space station um, but I mean, it's, it's amazing that the, what they accomplished at the time, uh, this was a long time ago. It was only, um, only a couple of years after the, the uh, moon mission. So there, there are a couple interesting things about the Salyut, um, stations themselves. It was the world's first successfully manned space station, um, mm-hmm. they did normally do shorter stays. Um, I mean, the ISS, for example, has been crewed, uh, nonstop for, I don't even know how long, but, um, I think it's now at about, I think it's over 15 years now. Yeah. And that's, there's always someone there. Whereas the Salute, uh, Salute one was like 20 days stays, uh, Salute 3 was like 63 day stays. Um, on the ISS, people are staying for months. I think it was um, Kelly. Uh, Scott Kelly? Scott Kelly stayed up there for, I can't remember, a year. A year. So it a year. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of interesting how, how short the stays were at first, I, I find. Um, also, though, Salyut stations, so between number one and a whole bunch of other ones, they actually had nine Salyut stations that were launched. Uh, Six of them were manned, and they were occupied across the whole Salyut line for 1,976 days, which is not bad, considering they started in 1970s, I think, anyway, but that's, that's me. I agree. Um, so the first generation of Salyut had five stations. Um, I think that's how I'm reading it right, actually. <laughs> well, yeah, a lot the, of the second generation started with Salyut 6, and that was in 1977. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to tell with their numbering. It's so bizarre. But yes... They- it, the Salyut's actually really interesting to try and figure out the numbering because um, the program... Some of them are military Some stations. of them are military, <laughs> and th- we don't really know much about the military ones if, if like, yeah. they have, like, different names. It was, it was, I mean, they're military. We don't know about them as much. So it's hard to say exactly how many Salyut's there were or exactly what the details about some of them were, but... Mm-hmm. This is where it started. The Salyut was where life in orbit began. began. Um, but we moved on a little bit. Skylab. So Skylab's pretty interesting. Um, it was uh, the first... Uh, this was the first U.S. station, right? Yes, it was. This yep. was the first U.S. station. Um, and things didn't go really great on this one. Um, damn you know, right the there. Damn you, the clips. Definitely not a spy satellite is the name of an NSA spy <laughs> satellite. That's good. I love it. Sorry. So Skylab was in orbit from 1973 to 1979. So, you know, as the as the Cold War went, pretty soon after <laughs> Salyut was up there, US was hot on their tail uh, two years later. Um, however, Skylab was damaged on launch. Um, it lost its heat shield, um, and, and one of its solar arrays was lost, and the other solar array got jammed. Um, not a very good launch. Um, 
However, because it was a space station in orbit, uh, they were able to uh, go up and repair it on the first manned mission. And it was the first repair in space. Um, the, de de the designers of Skylab um, emphasized habitability more than anything else that had made it into space to that point. Color schemes, a, wardro a wardroom for meals, and relaxation, books, and music. So basically, they were trying to make it somewhat livable, whereas most of the previous spacecraft and stations had not really cared much about that. They were functional. It's very let's let's go to space and survive in space, not let's go to space, yep. space, survive in space and like be comfortable, not not hate our lives uh, while we're up there, essentially. Um, so NASA experimented with living with the food from the Apollo missions, but volunteers were unable to do so. So for Skylab, NASA prioritized improvements to the taste and quality of the food. And Skylab did not have a waste recycling system. Hmm. Uh, Jade Starwatcher in, in chat was just mentioning the fun fact that so the Salyut had guns on them. And I, I did just look it up. And Salyut 3, uh, even though it was a civilian station, was equipped with a self-defense gun, which was designed for use aboard the station. Um, uh <laughs> Cold War, everybody. Yeah, well, I, I like the 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 next little bit of that. Some accounts claim that the station was equipped with a uh, Vulcan gun, which was a thirty millimeter cannon. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> whew, I the like the problem that. though. The problem with doing that shit in space though is it moves you backwards. <laughs> well, every every action is an equal and opposite reaction. There's a simple, simple solution. Have two of them. Fire one and then fire the other. <laughs> yeah, you fire in the opposite direction. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, boy. Um, sorry. Or unless you, like, fired it in a specific direction while firing the engine. <laughs> you know? Like, wow. Yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so, so, it's... I mean, we could go into a lot more detail, and, and there are, I mean, there's so much more research that has been done and can be looked into, but when we started going to space, we kind of realized that it's not comfortable. Nope. Um, at all. <laughs> and, and so Sally, at least at the beginning, was sort of, get to space, right? Uh, Russia was very much concerned with just getting there. Whereas when Skylab came into, into play, they started at least trying to make things more comfortable for the, the astronauts, um, trying some better food, basically, because uh, apparently the food in the Apollo missions was bad. Uh, yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is Skylab, even though it was up in space for six years, it was only inhabited for 171 days. Sorry. So, uh, Ghost just put an image in, in chat that I need to put up. I'm sorry. I apologize, everyone. Isn't it amazing? I actually got a better one, I think, from my uh, That's nephew. beautiful. That is beautiful. Uh, no, it might be the same one, actually. It's, it's perfect. It's the, it's the, the Futurama. Planet, Planet it's the Planet Express, Express from Futurama. Planet Express. Love it. Uh, sorry, sorry. That's a that's a slight aside, but only slight. <laughs> um. Yeah, yeah. See, I have an I have an image that I have a version of that image with the actual logo, the Planet Express ship logo. Um, oh, love it! Like, like, uh, like Jade Starwatcher in in chat was mentioning. There was also a uh, sort of a, a mutiny on Skylab. Oh, uh, good. Well, the the crew. So, 
uh, I was originally going to talk about this a little bit later, but I'm going to I'm going to make some some mention yeah, of it now. Put it in there. Uh, let's let's put it in here. It's that um, life for the early ast well life for astronauts period is highly scheduled. Um, mm -hmm. So on Mir at least, um, which we'll get to later. Like their lives were essentially scheduled down to the second, um, and and it was previously as well with with the previous uh, missions as well. So, for example, um, the crew of Skylab Four. So, in December of nineteen seventy three, uh, there was a three man crew who basically just turned off radio communication with NASA with ground control, and relaxed because <laughs> you know they were on the phone nonstop to to NASA right and mm -hmm. the the workload expectations were were huge and yeah they they said screw this and and shut stuff off cuz they wanted yeah. time to relax they wanted time to to essentially look out the window and be able to sit and watch earth so uh it's it's kind of interesting when you start when we start talking about um excuse me uh just life in space and we're just talking about life in orbit right now right it's they're still they're astronauts but they can look out the window and look down at earth and they have a relatively short return time i mean if something goes wrong they can come back yep um, we, and we have you know despite all the doom and gloom we're quickly getting to the point probably in the next year or so where if there was a problem there we could probably get them home you it, know um there was not... there's a problem right now with the <laughs> <laughs> well, sort of sort of a problem with one of the um uh the capsules that's attached to the iss mm -hmm. Because specifically, it should be noted, this is not actually part of the ISS. Yeah. It's part of the Soyuz spacecraft. <clears throat> but we're yeah. at the point now where if it was absolutely necessary to get the astronauts off the ISS, it could probably be done relatively quickly. And yep. once, once, for example, the, uh, the Dragon crew module from, from SpaceX is like actually authorized for use it could probably be done even quick more quickly because spacex will have falcons That's that the they launch exactly they'll have they'll have falcons in storage so yeah they can probably launch pretty fast yeah dirk um, uh it is the the drill marks that they well it's not just the drill marks it's the hole the hole <laughs> the drill hole the drill hole <laughs> that they found so <laughs> there is a hole in the freaking thing there's a hole and in my space shuttle, dear Eliza. It should be noted right now, actually, that there is a bit of a thing going on right now. Yes. Um, NASA and Roscosmos traditionally have gotten along very, very well. Um, Dmitry Rogozin, who the U.S. despises, um, was put in charge of Roscosmos earlier this year. And uh, he suggested when this drill thing happened that the reason or what, what had happened is that a NASA astronaut drilled a hole in the Soyuz capsule so that they could go home early because apparently one of the Americans was sick. Um, this is total bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it is yeah. they're trying to cover up for the fact that there was a manufacturing problem with Soyuz. Because um, that is bad. Yeah. Um, it's a hole in a spacecraft. Yeah. It's very bad. Now, it, it's not going to cause a problem, but it sure could have. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's actually really scary. I mean, this is... The ISS is supposed to be one of the few, like, international cooperations. And yep. 
99% of the time it's worked perfectly. And way. now Russia's being Russia. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's, <laughs> let's well, talk. Specifically, Dmitry Rogozin is being Dmitry Rogozin. Yeah. Uh, um, that said, we should talk a little bit more about Russia. Salute. With more the salute. The second generation. Yeah. So this is the second generation, uh, a second generation Salyut station. There weren't as many of these. Um, there were lots of the first generation. There were only, I think, two in the second generation of Salyut. Um, these started seeing longer stays. So you got up to uh, the first long duration stay in 1977 had a 96-day um Day on the station, which is was pretty long for that time. That's uh, you know, it's over three months. Um, and also, the first Black, Hispanic, and Asian people in space were all part of missions to Salyut Six, which was their Salyut Six and Salyut Seven um, were the two second generation stations. Um, and then Salyut Seven, so the last Salyut station, was deorbited in 1991. Let's move along to one that I think a lot of us remember. Well, at least I remember from when I was younger. Yes. Uh, this was the this was the first day, space station in my sort of experience, and I was actually pretty sad when it was deorbited. What? Oh, right. This is the one. Wait, one second. I forgot about it's this one. It's being a dipshit? No, I forgot that this one is, is <laughs> different. Uh, Sorry. One sec. One moment. Uh, this one is here. Ha ha! Jade Starwatcher, that's actually a really good point. So, New Glenn, um, New Glenn doesn't have a, uh, New Glenn's a great, a great option for it, but it's probably, um, about three years away from being fully operational. Um, but it, once it gets a crew capsule, it will also be a good option. Boeing Starliner is very close to finished. Um, along with Crew Dragon. And Dream Chaser um, is a cargo ship right now um, that will launch in 2020, uh, but it is designed to host humans, so hopefully in the future. It's coming. Um, Mir is cool. This was a much larger station. This was not the same as the Soviet stations. Um... I really liked the station a lot when I was young. So, for Mir, it was based on the Salyut designs. And actually, interestingly, the ISS is based on the Salyut design too, kind of. The the first core module was was went all the way back to the Salyut designs because they had such a long storied history. They worked. Yep. They were, and that is honestly with space stuff, one of the reasons Russia is still so in the space race is because they don't have any money. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they found designs, they found designs that worked really well and they just used them yeah. forever. Um, the Soyuz is still used. The rocket and the spacecraft, these are vehicles that are have been changed somewhat over the years. But they're essentially 50 years old at this point. But they work. So they use them. Um, Salute, the Salute design worked. So it kept being used over and over and over again. Um, so Mir was in orbit from 1986 to 2001. And it was the first modular space station. And it was in, assembled in orbit from 1986 until 1996. Mir was the first continuously inhabited long-term research station in orbit and held the record for the longest continuous human presence in space at 3,644 days, which is just shy of 10 years. So I, I, I was going to originally talk about this here, and I just, I want to, talk a little bit more about the the sort of the timetable the scheduling that they had on mirror so um wait uh, sorry i want to double check something quickly mm -hmm. not a problem 
I can do a dance. Do a dance. Um, I just want to ch- double check one thing about Mir. When... Because I, I believe, like, Mir had... <laughs> Mir is... Like, the ISS had international cooperation, but so did Mir. Um, Thank you, Jack. Oh, woo, thanks. Um, but I can't... I I'm trying to figure... I can't remember if... Uh, Mir had American astronauts aboard it. I think it did. International cooperation. Because they they had cooperation with I, with a lot of other com- uh, countries, France, UK. I don't think so. Probably because of um, the Cold War. I that's what I thought, but I am seeing there was apparently an agreement between the United States of America and the Russian Federation concerning cooperation in the exploration and use of outer space for people's full purposes. That's the name of the agreement, by the way, um, which apparently called for a short space program, one American astronaut being dis- deployed to Mir, and two Russian cosmonauts being deployed on a space shuttle i'm just trying to figure um, out yes yes there yes there was um yeah, yeah. um so the two-man crew in 1996 aboard soyuz tm23 um were so- soon joined by u.s crew member shannon lucid who was brought to the station by atlantis so it was br- she was brought there by the shuttle this is part of the shuttle mir program um and this mission saw the first joint U.S. spacewalk take, take place on Mir, um, deploying the Mir environment, environmental effects payload package on the docking module. Basically, she was there for 188 days, um, which is fairly impressive. Yeah. And um, yeah, so there was there were also Americans that, that uh, were on board that space station and, and a whole bunch of other... Um, nations as well do you want to like look through them um, or, or talk talk about them, I, them? I was more going to talk about one of the astronauts basically saying that um every single second aboard mirror was accounted for um mm-hmm. and there was basically no imp- improvisation allowed you did you slept for exactly this many seconds and you did this research for this many seconds and you ate for this and and they had no no leniency and that's kind of something like we were talking about earlier on um skylab which which led to the mutiny of this i almost want to say a difference between the american and and the russian ways of doing things whereas the russians were so incredibly um strict and uh, other astronauts uh, apparently found that it uh, led to a lot more stress and not mm-hmm. having any leniency in being able to do things sort of the way that they thought was best led to a lot of stress and a lot of frustration and made things a lot harder on the astronauts. So, um, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, I heard the same thing. It was re- very interesting how sort of that examination of different ways of uh, dealing with those spacecraft crews could, I mean, or space station crews, because I mean, they're already enough stress as it is. So I think they do need some downtime and I don't think there was much downtime allotted in the Russian schedule. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. so the next one up is um, the most recent foray into space stations. Um, this is Tiangong-1. Um, this is a the first Chinese space station. Um, and it had one... It was launched in 2011. It had one unmanned uh, visit and two manned visits. And it was originally planned... Keep in mind, we know... The Chinese <laughs> do not talk about their space program very much. They're very secretive. 
Um, they're becoming more open, but um, part of this is that the U.S. is actually barred and not allowed at all to cooperate with China in space. It is um, a big topic of conversation, I'll put it that way. But um, but that's part of the reason why we don't have any information is we're not allowed to work together. Um, they're not allowed to work together. I don't know if Canada. Yeah, they're not allowed. To, I, I'm not sure if Canada's barred, but I mean, we're Canada's Canadian. such a close. We're, we have such a close association with NASA. It's probably yeah. the same effect. Um, hey, however, without, without Canada, NASA would have no arms. Exactly. Um, so the, the station was originally planned the last two years. And for some reason that we actually have no idea about, um, it was never deorbited. Um, and they never visited again after 2013. But it was never deorbited either. And then there was a big thing in the media. You probably saw it. They lost control of the space station early this year, and it deorbited uncontrolled, which is lost not good. Um, because a vehicle of that size, <clears throat> there is the potential for pieces of it to get to the ground. Um, so it could have basically rained down bits of flaming metal on people on the ground. <laughs> But thankfully it didn't. It crashed into the ocean, but it was under no control whatsoever. So that was just good luck. I don't know basically. about you, but I personally prefer it when uh, flaming hot <laughs> chunks of metal don't rain down on me. Just throwing really? it out there. Yeah. I know. I know I'm weird that way, but. Well, that's strange. You're very picky. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so then. Um, they uh, they recently launched uh, a couple of years ago the Tiangong Two um, space station. I think it's only been or it's only been visited uh, twice. Um, but uh, no, actually, so it's only been visited once um, in 2016, and. Uh, this space station is, uh, I believe, planned to deorbit uh, sometime in the next couple of years because um, China is actually in the process of building a large um, or in the process of starting to uh, plan and construct a large space station similar to the design of the ISS. Um, and... Uh, which is interesting because, like we were talking about uh, last episode, China's also started working on reusable boosters as well, sort of like uh, SpaceX. Yeah. Uh, yeah. China's pouring a lot of money into their space programs. And like we said, up to this point, we haven't really known much. Uh, the U.S. has been barred from working with them, so we don't know anything about their space stations, really. But like Jade Starwatcher in chat mentions, um, they are now apparently working with the European Space Agency for the new space station that they're yeah. working on. So that is... ESA has been sending astronauts to China to train with yeah. the Chinese Space Agency. Which yeah. is a lot... That, that will hopefully lead to a lot more openness and a lot more knowledge of what China is doing in space. Because mm -hmm. one of the reasons that... Um, well, that, that, that one cooperation mission on Mir and why the ISS are so important and hopefully this new space station is international cooperation. It's the idea that regardless of what a bunch of um, um, I'm trying to think of a word that is PG-13 here uh, poo-poo heads we are on Earth the idea at least is we don't take that to space. Now of course um, someone decided to sort of ruin some of that with a space force but the idea is <laughs> we don't take our petty human problems with us into space. And hopefully China opening things up and opening stuff up to the ESA more will will help. Yeah. Um, so the, um, the way the space station... So the space station will be large, but it won't be as large as the ISS because um, the ISS is ridiculously large. Um, 
It'll be about a fifth the mass of the International International Space Station and is mostly comprised of um, of two experiment modules, a service and a service module. Um and a core module have it'll have a whole bunch of docking ports and solar arrays and all that good stuff as you normally would see. Um, it will the core module is planned to launch in 2020, so it will start uh, being constructed at that point. <clears throat> so. Um, since David's gone, uh, I guess it's time for us to uh, continue trying to talk about the Chinese space station. <laughs> um, so like the ISS, it will be assembled in orbit. It'll be launched. Uh, each of the modules will be launched separately. Um, it's planned to be assembled currently in the 2020, 2020 to 2022 time frame. And uh, um, that might slip into 2023 or even further. You know how these things go. But uh, China's space program has generally been very good um, and not, uh, not too bad with, with dates. Um, hey, you're back. I am. Hello. Shall we move along to the, uh, the big one? Let's, let's move along to the big one. I'm going to... Okay. This is the first one I've done so far today, so let's see if this works. Come on. And of course I get the music, which is annoying as hell, but... You guys won't hear it, so that's okay. Uh, this is... Um, well, this is, this is the ISS. I love this video. This is the essentially the construction of the ISS as each heart is put together. Canada arm. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, it's just music, so. Oh, man. I just find this this so fascinating, the the construction of the whole station. Yeah, I, it it's so cool. It's interesting to to see that it started from like nothing, and and keep in mind all of this moving around and stuff. They're doing this in space. I love yep. that. And it's I mean most of the construction is done with EVAs. Yes, yeah. crazy, crazy. It's. They just Boop. send up parts that they need and, and attach them. Um, Love it. It's actually surprised to see how long it took the Capola to get up there because it's so cool. It's it's funny, but it I I think this almost more than just about anything else underscores the. We can only send so much up at a time. Like the ISS yep. has to be huge. It's big enough for what six six people to be living on there. It's, at once. it's actually like, it's math. It's like it's bigger than your house. Yeah, it is it's, huge. Inside, it's huge. But they um, can't even really send. Like they send up not even a room at once. Yeah, no, it's uh, well, and the shuttle had to do all of it, right? Because yeah. the shuttle had payload bay but even it you know you can only send up so much the next generation super heavy launch vehicles will be able to big launch much larger things um like the iss if you're just going by mass i think the iss is like 400 tons if you're talking about um, with the solar panels and everything like unfurled then it like commander lama says it's it's about the size of a football field which is yeah Jai bloody freaking enormous, really. Uh, fun fact: a uh, the Titanic was larger than many football fields. I don't know why I'm 
talking about the Titanic <laughs> right now. Okay. Uh, All right. It's late and I'm no. really tired. So, <laughs> so uh, the ISS. The Titanic. <laughs> yeah, sorry. ISS. Right. That's space. The ISS um, weighs about 420 tons. Um, if you're just going by purely weight, which obviously you can't, but if you're just going by weight, something like the BFR would be able to launch the space, uh, the ISS in four launches, uh, five, maybe, um, regardless, it would be able to be constructed much faster. Um, and that just means that in the near future, in the next five years or so, we're going to be able to start doing these types of on orbit construction a lot cheaper and a lot easier and uh, so hopefully that leads to a lot more of that type of activity and also one um, of the things that's limiting currently is there is a maximum size for for parts right you can only build yeah. an area this big and that is there's a maximum when when something like the the bfr comes on that maximum is going to grow Exactly. Yeah. And that that is important because we can start building larger bays, make things I mean, if you've looked at anything from the ISS, it is pretty cramped. They have a not the largest diameter that they can work with, quite frankly. And everything has to be fit in that. It's why it's a it's a series of tubes, really, is what it is. It's a series Isn't that the of the internet? Uh maybe. Or a sewer. Wait, those are the same. <laughs> Crap. So, um, some interesting things about the, the... So, it's called the International Space Station, right? Well, it is a truly international effort. Um, there are pieces of the space station, so actual physical pieces of the space station from NASA, Roscosmos, JAXA, which is the Japanese space agency, ESA, which is European the space, Agency, space agency, and the CSA, which is the Canadian space agency. Um... God, so there's this. five space agencies that, that contributed actual physical pieces to the space station. To fly a rocket ship, you need... Uh, um, poop. What's wrong? Um, I hate ads. I'm going to do it. Oh, I'm going to do this in an old-fashioned way. Deal. There's a cannabis what? ad because YouTube hates me. And uh, that's it. Yeah, screw YouTube. Um, and there have been, uh, astronauts or, uh, space tourists, um, or cosmonauts from 17 different nations that have visited the International Space Station. Um, so there's a lot of, that international thing isn't just lip service. There has been a lot of international cooperation on this, on the station. It has currently been continuously occupied for 17 years and 320 days. Why is that showing up? Oh my god, what's happening? Sorry, I'm I'm breaking everything. Oh good. Carry on. Okay, Sorry. I'm just gonna keep talking. I'm yeah, just gonna keep, keep talking, talking, please. <laughs> um some interesting facts about the ISS. Um Um Yeah. So currently it is being uh, supplied by a series of uh, unmanned vehicles. Um, those are the Progress for the Progress, the Dragon, the Cygnus, and the H2 transfer vehicle or HTB. Um, so Progress is a Russian spacecraft. Um, American, the American spacecraft are SpaceX's Dragon and um, Northrop Grumman's. Um, Cygnus, sorry, Northrop Grumman just bought Orbital ATK, so I had to remember. <laughs> uh, actually, this this now. is just a um a time lapse of the ISS orbiting. Yeah, so this is awesome. Earth, just I love this. I love this video. It's so cool. Um. And uh, so, and then of course we have the Japanese HTV. So those are the four um, basically cargo ships that resupply the space station. The Progress, the Progress ship from Russia, has uh, been the ship that has mostly um, 
boosted the ISS because it, it is in a pretty low orbit. It's only 400 kilometers up. And um, so occasionally it needs to be boosted into a higher orbit because it starts to lose or um, altitude. Um, so generally that's done with the Progress spacecraft. The ISS actually has its own engines as well, but they pref they prefer to use them as uh, sparingly as possible. Um, just to limit the wear and tear on the space station. Can I just take a, a, a second to mention how bloody gorgeous our planet is and that I really wish we could see it like this more often and maybe if more people saw it from up there, we wouldn't be, um, we wouldn't be well, as hasty everyone... as we are about destroying it. Absolutely. Everyone should throw on their VR headsets and or just glue themselves to YouTube in 2023 and you'll be able to see it yourself. Kind of. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I or, just... or, you know, become a world renowned artist and get the attention of Yuzaka Muzawa. I don't think that's Muzawa. happening for, for me at least. So, well, I think it is. <laughs> but by then you'll be a world renowned novelist. So, Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so um, that is the International Space Station. Yes. A lot of people know know it very well, but we wanted to touch on it. Um, the ISS, I, I just... Like, the ISS is still phenomenal. Um, uh, it sure is. Uh, I'm going to be showing some videos later uh, when we're talking a little bit more about life in orbit. And you'll notice that quite a few of them actually come from uh, from the ISS. Uh, a Canadian, uh, Chris Hadfield, was up there, and he was doing. He was amazing. He was amazing. He was doing largely science, but he was also doing just a ridiculous amount of outreach, of explanations, of just just explaining space and explaining life on the ISS and we're going to play just a couple of the videos but you really should just look up some of the the videos of uh of him explaining life oh yes oh yes that is yeah I can't play it though we can't play it because Twitch would uh uh kill us but uh, Jade Star Rocker, uh, Star Watcher, sorry. The music of the David Bowie song is just. Sorry, I need to. I'm I'm looking it up now. Um, so. Do you want to throw up that graphic for the gateway? I will in just a moment. First, I want to uh, just put this in chat so that everyone can go watch it later because it is. Um, beautiful. Just I I can't play it because uh, Twitch would They'll nuke us. would nuke us for playing uh, copyrighted audio. But um, yeah, I I when I first saw this years ago when when it was done, I definitely cried. I'm not at all ashamed in saying it because it was uh, fantastic. Um, yes, sorry. Uh, that image. Let me grab it. Oh, the gateway. Oh. Yes, so let's talk a little bit about the gateway. So I'm going to talk about names for a moment. Okay. Um, NASA sucks at names a lot of the time. <laughs> this is a very good example. So this the gateway started its life as the Deep Space Gateway. And then it became the Lunar Orbital Platform. And then it became the Lunar, lunar Orbital Platform Dash Gateway. <laughs> and then it became the Lunar Gateway. And now it is called just the Gateway. This, this, this is like seven name changes in the course of like a year. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, this is the general design of the gateway. You'll notice it is much, much smaller. Yeah, no shit. Oh. Um, it is much, much smaller than um, 
than the ISS. It is a um, pretty small station, not designed at all to be permanently uh, inhabited. Um, it's much more of a... Uh... Sorry, I'm <laughs> just... Yes. Um, uh, Gateway is a phenomenal... Uh, I love it. I just... Anyway, sorry. Carry on. Yeah. Um, so... One of the things to note about this is that this design for the space station is in no way final because none of it is actually <laughs> even official yet. Um, there is no money for the gateway yet. There is money in the next budget proposal for the gateway. Um, we'll see if it goes ahead. Uh, there are a lot of people who think it is a useless endeavor. Um, and the reason for that, there is, that's not just people hating on space. It doesn't do anything particularly well um i might be a little mean there but it's um a lot of people believe and i believe it would make way more sense to put a um base a, sur a surface base on the moon rather than putting something in orbit of the moon and then having to then go from the from that platform down to the ground NASA's argument is that you can launch Mars missions from the gateway and then come back to the gateway and then come from the gateway back to Earth, which is apparently easier. Um, I'm not sure I agree. Um, also and with there the are a lot of there are a lot of people like Robert Zubrin who his his uh, his description of the gateway is the lunar toll booth. Um, <laughs> but, and so there's a lot of really big concerns about it because it will cost a lot of money. It will only be occupied for very short periods of time. And, um, there's just a concern it will never be as useful as we hope, especially. And then there's also the concern that if it's not continuously inhabited and then the ISS is deorbited, we're left without a continuous presence presence of um Americans you know american space. astronaut american astronauts in space now i do want to take yeah. a moment to uh touch on one of my lovely little pet peeves here um uh oh uh oh it, it's just that uh oh nasa doesn't get jack for funding nope um uh Nakara, can you quickly look up the percentage of the budget? It's point it's point five percent. Point five percent. Yeah. So NASA gets point five percent of the US budget. It might even be point four percent now. It's really low. And what they do with that budget is just outstanding. But when it comes to something like the gateway or the SLS, which is the single largest stupid thing that NASA's been forced to do. Um, <laughs> see how what I did there? SLS, single largest stupid. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's it's no, it's 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 genuinely <sighs> disappointing. As someone who comes from a country that doesn't have the ability to support something like NASA. We have a Canadian space agency. We have a Canadian space program. We've developed the, the, we could do more than we do. We could, I do, still think we, I think we could do more than we do as well. But part of the thing is we've always sent everything to NASA. We've always worked hand in hand with NASA. And as NASA's budget has been shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk over the years, it's really disappointing to see if NASA got, double its budget which again double its budget would still not even be a percent of the united states's yearly budget they could do mm -hmm. the gateway and we wouldn't really care as much because it wouldn't be as big of a waste of their money like please please everyone convince people to vote and convince people to vote for people that people like science will and will fund yeah. space it is Actually, <sighs> even go beyond that. Try and find somebody who will fund space not just because it has jobs in their district, because that causes problems. Uh, that is how we. That's Star how we end up with I have joined the Planetary Society. I am also a member of the Planetary Society. Yep. 
They are amazing. They are. Um, but uh, the reason SLS is such a mess is because of the whole political thing where you have to have a piece of this ba- rocket built in every state in order to make it politically feasible. It's a mess. Anyway, r- moving on from yes, all of sorry. that. Sorry, sorry, I just... Stuff. Now, what the idea behind the gateway is, is that you can go repeatedly from the gateway down to the surface of the moon. But the problem is you're di- introducing another step. But you can do that. And th- potentially you could do many sample return missions back and forth, even robotic ones. Um, there's lots of possibilities here. And uh, at the heart of it, even though I've ranted and raved a little bit about the gateway... If it gets done, I'll still be happy because it's more things that are being done in space. Um, and so, thumbs up. Also, it's likely part of this may get launched on a Falcon Heavy. Because the power and propulsion um, module will be launched before SLS is ready. And it's also pretty small. So it will, should be able to fit in uh, a commercial rocket. <clears throat> now I need to bring this back up. There we go. Okay. Um so do you want to talk a little bit about life in space here? Uh yeah, let's let's try and talk a little bit about life in space. For like 9 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um <laughs> wait, uh why is that there? Uh I'm going to let you go on this for a bit. I've been my throat's starting to get sore. <laughs> no, uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There. Okay, I'm going to try and play another video of, uh, mm. this is uh, from the Canadian Space Agency. This is Chris Has- Hadfield um, on the ISS. Basically, uh, this is what the inside of the ISS looks like. Uh, you've got the nice little flags up the top there with all the countries that have visited and take part. And this is him answering how you sleep in space. Um it's part of this this large series of videos that the Canadian Space Agency did on the ISS, and there's that video we were showing earlier. Um, can't, does it have something? Sped up to a ridiculous degree. <laughs> I love it. Wait, 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 maybe. Aha! Subtitles. Um, so basically what he's saying is really all they have in their sleeping bunks, which the ISS has bunks. Previous iterations didn't really. Um, They've each got their own little private room. But all they have in there is a sleeping bag. Because there's no gravity. They just float. You don't need... You don't need pillows. You don't need anything. You just... slip into some super comfy Russian full-length pajamas. Uh, pill would be kind of useless because well, yeah. <laughs> it just like float around inside the cabin with you. I know. <laughs> um, but ah, oh, just weightlessness looks so cool. Are you going to space, David? No, I'm not going to to space. But you sure? This is look like look at his little bunk. So he's got his laptop there. That's awesome. So he can like watch videos and stuff before he sleeps. But there's just there's a little sleeping bag, and he just pulls out his sleeping bag that's literally just tied to the wall with some twine. And I find that so interesting. They like half the stuff on the ISS is just oh, this works. This will work. Yeah, it, it works. So who cares, right? Like. We don't need anything more than this. So let's run with it. He's got a little water thing there. I love that he is I love that his sleeping bag has arms. Well yeah, because <laughs> your arms <laughs> want to fl- when you're asleep in gravity, your arms sit at your side or rolled up under something or whatever. But um in space they just float. So everything is different. Even even something is theoretically simple and normal to us as sleeping. sleeping. And like Commander Lama mentions there, that's part of the problem. So long-term weightlessness is is a big, big issue. It's one of our really big issues, not just with in-orbit, um, life in-orbit, but life 
anywhere in space. So Mars has a gravity similar to ours. It probably won't be as big a problem, no. isn't it? No, no, it's thirty percent. It's more than it's more, than, more than, than the moon. It's more than the moon. More than it's zero. more than the, uh, more than zero. It's closer. It's it's better. It's significantly better. Yeah. Like one of the problems, and and we're gonna talk about that more in future episodes but one of the main problems with with especially life in orbit is that there's none so there's you get um muscle atrophy uh skeleton deterioration um osteopenia uh fluid redistribution your cardiovascular system slows you produce less red blood cells you've got balance disorders uh your immune system weakens you lose body mass um Nasal big con- nasal this, congestion yeah. is a, like you just your body doesn't work as well. Uh, also, excess flatulence is apparently an issue in space. Who knew? Um, another one that that's actually become more noticeable. Like, we've we've learned more about it lately. Is um, vision is abnormal is uh, adversely affected the longer you're in space. Yeah. And that is due to the fluid redistribution. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's bad. We have we have problems to solve. We have problems to solve. Yeah, the, the, I I think that's the thing with with NASA though. They don't view them as like shit. Space is always going to suck. They're like, okay, well, we have to figure out how to deal with it. Um, and and basically, one of the things that is uh, that I think makes life in space worse than something on Mars, even if Mars has a third, like it's, it's not quite earth-like. It's still better. The problem is in space, you can't just have a normal treadmill, like to, to combat lots of these uh, side effects, the muscle atrophy, the skeleton deterioration, et cetera, you have to exercise a lot, right? Constantly. Um, One of the, the big things that, uh, astronauts have to do like one of the large things on their schedules is is exercise and making sure that they eat properly and and try and maintain weight and all that um and part of the problem is in two hours a day two hours every day for exercise yeah two hours a day which is uh two hours more than i do um but like you can't just use weights because there's no gravity to Mm. lift against right so you can kind of see this this contraption that they have there but they have to find ways to modify exercises and make them work in space which is it's not always all that easy so you've got that for for lifting weights um they've also got I think this, they've got like a, a treadmill that, but to be on the treadmill, they have to strap you into the treadmill so that you don't float away from the tread. It's just, yep. some of these problems won't happen as much on something like Mars because you'll at least yep. have some gravity to work with. And, and we'll get into this more in, in future episodes. Even on the episodes. moon. Even on I mean, the moon. One of there's the things, some gravity. There's some, yeah. Uh, and we just, we know that it's really bad in space. We know that the, the muscle atrophy and the bone loss and stuff is really bad in space. We don't really know as much what it'll be like on something like Mars. How much? Eh, we'll see. But um, some little little interesting things I kind of thought was um, the space treadmill is named Colbert. Um, there's the stationary bike, which is named Sevis. And there's the ARID, which is the device that simulates weightlifting. So, just NASA coming up with stupid names. <laughs> um, what else? Um, ah, yes, here. Mold. God, let me <laughs> let me uh, throw this up quickly. Give me a second. Uh, I, I'm gonna hit mold in a second. First, I want to hit um, before mold. Before mold. <laughs> Uh, I want to hit eating in space. Yeah, that's a little interesting. 
so eating in space is also uh, not fun because, well, here's Chris Hadfield eating in space. He's going to eat some <laughs> chocolate cake. Chocolate pudding cake. Yeah. Um, in a pouch. But everything has to be sent up, so you have to try and keep things as... Basically, you have to play I Ikea with everything that you send up to space. Um, it has to be flat packed, right? Because you don't yep. want bulky things taking up room because you could fit other things in that room and it can't be heavy. So... Simon. Yeah. I just... Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's really notable is that uh, they do have bread up there, um, but they have to use flatbreads because they can't have a lot of crumbs. Yeah. Uh, crumbs are very dangerous in the space station. They can get into places where you really don't want crumbs. Um, so they have a lot of, they eat a lot of flatbread and they'll like, they'll put like honey and peanut butter and stuff on it. Um, and, so that's kind of decent food, but. And like you see there. As he's drinking from that, he has to close it before he finishes because even when he was drinking there just for a second, you actually saw um, a few beads of liquid fly off and they just have to really float work, away, float away because <laughs> it doesn't fall. It doesn't. It just it everything goes wherever. Um, and yeah, uh, like Commander mentions, they they. They've started sending more and better stuff, better food up. Like I was talking about earlier with, on, uh, crap, I don't remember which station now, but they know that food makes a difference and entertainment makes a difference. And NASA are working all the time. Uh, I remember actually, I think it was earlier this year, NASA had a huge uh, competition with a whole bunch of, um, I can't remember if it was high school or, um, like culinary schools. They had a competition with a whole bunch of culinary schools to come up with new dishes to be sent to the ISS, trying to come up with better food because food matters. Um, everything matters. There's so much. Especially just, when life is already difficult. Uh, yeah. Food is, is, is important. Yeah. Um, hygiene is difficult. I mean, you can go and look up, um, how you pee in space but essentially you strap a thing to yourself and it's it like everything is is more difficult in space um one of the things that uh that's also a bit of an issue is is um mold so uh there's an interesting little little bit here of extremophile mold so in the 90s um when did Mir get deorbited? 2001. Yeah. So in the 90s, as Mir was sort of getting on in years, quite frankly, uh, and getting towards the end of its life, they found 90 spaces, uh, uh, species of microorganisms in 1990. That was four years after the launch. Um, by the time they shut the station down in 2001, they found 140 different types of microorganisms. As, as space stations get older, they get contaminated. Uh, there's molds that, that develop, and those molds can produce acids that'll eat metal, they'll eat glass, they'll eat rubber. We don't really know how to deal with that all that well yet. Um, one of the things you see as a recurring or as a recurring thing when it comes to space stations is they all get deorbited. Mm -hmm. They reach a, a limit and that we're like, they're too dirty. They're too old. We got to get rid of them because yeah. you can't clean. So the ISS itself <laughs> is going to be, um, we, we think it's a pretty good chance the ISS will be around for at least seven more years. Um, 2025 is pretty secure. There are definitely groups that want to extend it to 2028 or even 2030. 
Um, but that is seen as 2028 is somewhat likely, but 2028 is also the end of the usable, um, like sort of warranted lifespan for a lot of the parts on the station. So you'll probably see there in the mid to late 2020s that the ISS will either be turned over to a commercial entity that wants to refurbish it and use it or be deorbited, which is much more likely. Yeah. The ISS is incredibly expensive to run. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's there's one other thing that I thought was, was kind of important to touch on when we're talking about life in space or in orbit in general. Um, and it's something that's been touched on uh, about a trip to Mars, and we'll probably touch on that aspect of it more. But uh, that's radiation. So... Um, astronauts and cosmonauts that visit the ISS and orbit the Earth, and this is only at 400 kilometers, um, but they're not protected by the Earth's atmosphere. Um, the Earth's atmosphere protects us from a hell of a lot. Uh, so when, when they're up there orbiting Earth without the protection of the atmosphere, they're basically... Uh, subjected to 30 times or not 30 times but um it's an increase the the amount of radiation that they're exposed to is increased by a factor of 30 so in one week aboard the iss astronauts are exposed to basically the equivalent of one year of exposure on the ground um it's a lot um but yeah, and the ISS isn't isn't particularly a isn't a particularly big problem in terms of radiation. Yeah, and it's only going to get worse as you get further out into space and, and less mm -hmm. protected. And but e even just in the ISS, uh, since of the Apollo Moon missions, so just in between you know Earth and the Moon, um, astronauts have reported flashes of light even when they have their eyes closed. Um, that could be caused by cosmic rays passing through the eye and, and producing a flash of light or triggering a nerve response. And th that's kind of scary. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's kind of scary, but Absolutely. all this, I mean, that's we're we're kind of at the end of the, the effects of life on, on the ISS. Um, but Space doesn't really like us, I guess is what we're trying to say. Well, we're we're adapted to live down here. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's and and that's something that's interesting. Like we're we, stretching our legs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we're stretching our legs, but we don't know what that's going to do to our legs. Do we need legs in space? Yeah. It's helpful. I don't know. I, uh, yeah. That's, that's life in orbit, I guess. Um, one of the things that should be, should be mentioned before we sign off here. Yeah. Um, another thing that people kind of have to get their heads around is hygiene's not super easy in space. Yeah. Um, aboard the ISS, they've had a bunch of things that they've done to make it somewhat easier they have toothpaste that they can swallow um, because there isn't really a sink. Um, they have uh, they have shampoo that is rinseless shampoo, so you just literally rub it on your hair. Um, they have a shower, but it's not really what you'd consider a shower. <laughs> um, and uh, very limited ability to, to actually properly It get smells clean. up there. Oh, yeah. I'm um, sure it does. The ISS um, smells very, I would imagine very it, badly. I don't. You think so? I think I, so. I, I, I think probably it does. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, showering in space is not really easy, and uh, hygiene in general is not very easy. Uh, toilet toilets are have been a very, very famous problem for yep. space programs. They're hard to get to working properly. They break. Um, the ISS's toilet has broken several times. Um, it's um, 
these are issues that we need to continue to work on and solve, yeah. and we'll get there eventually. But, and and um, sorry, I think these that, are things we need to talk about. I, I think that uh, the ISS is actually better smelling wise than previous ones because they've done so much air filtering. But I believe there were lots of reports of uh, older ones, Skylab, Mirror, and such, uh, being real bad. But sounds fun. Yeah. Um, I think that's it for this evening. I think that evening. is just about it. I uh Yeah, we 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 covered the basically all the space stations that have existed this far. We covered uh the last week in space with Dear Moon. Uh we talked a bunch about life in orbit. Um sort of just the problems that we know about right now when it comes to all the space stations that have existed, the things that we've, we've sort of learnt, uh, in, in orbit so far, we will be back next week, one week from now, Tuesday, hopefully it'll be a slightly earlier show. Uh, sorry about Mm -hmm. it being so late everyone, but next week, um, it's going to be, we're going to be covering, uh, the moon and Mars. So and how to live there, how to live there, how to get there, uh, and what the plans are, and then after that, um, we think we're basically done with with our current um, scope, and I think we're going to go back. Someone asked uh, for an in depth look at the um, the Apollo missions and the Saturn and such, so we might do that. Uh, that sounds like a good time to me, but I'm probably towards the end of the year. I would like to get into, um, I, I think we're, I'm going to get into, uh, focusing on a specific, we're gonna do some planetary science stuff. Yes. So we're going to choose a specific mission and we'll do a huge deep dive into just one planetary science mission. Cause there's some amazing ones that don't get enough play. Some of the things opinion. NASA plan to do are phenomenal um for those of uh jade star watcher in chat i know as you say you just you wish you had discovered the show sooner uh we do actually have a youtube um yeah there are, are, are we, we do have archives there. there should actually be archives on twitch and on youtube uh which would be great if i knew what our youtube rl <laughs> url was um so yeah, actually, we can quickly just touch on those. Um, oh wait, is uh, it this? I would love to cover those missions. Fire M. Um, the two that we're currently looking at, uh, Hayabusa two, is at the com as at the asteroid Ryugu, and um, Osiris Rex from NASA is currently approaching um, asteroid Bennu, and will intercept it in December. So we'll have two missions at Asteroids in December. Uh, I just cool. put a YouTube link in there. Thankfully, it's it's actually really simple. It's youtube.com slash relay underscore SC. Uh, go to playlists. We like our underscores. I love our underscores. There is a playlist there. There is a Relay Space playlist if you'd like to watch the, the two previous episodes. And this one will be going up there uh, shortly after we're done. Come back next week. Follow us on Twitter if you want to know when we go live because uh, the times sort of shift here and there where Canadian hockey exists and hockey takes precedence. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Lava. Yeah, we should touch on Amu. Amu 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 Yes. Amu Amu Sure. Um. <laughs> That said, though, uh, that'll be it for us this week. Thank you all so much for hanging out, and we hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks, everyone. See you in the verse.